All right. Well, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 to 14 tonight. And this is entitled um, The Parable of the Wedding Feast, or Come to the Banquet, in which this invitation is given by this king in this story. So we're going to just jump right into the text. It says, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good or both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen." So, once again, like most parables, it's always good to kind of see what is the context here. So I'm just going to bring your attention to um, right before this parable again, because we see at the beginning of 22, Jesus is answering, right? It says, it answered and spoke to them again by the parables and said. So if you look just a couple verses before, it says, now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. So once again, we see these Pharisees, these scribes, they're hearing these parables, right? And we already know in Matthew 13, much earlier in this gospel, that Jesus was saying, the reason I'm doing these parables is to conceal some of these kingdom spiritual truths. And so now they're starting to perceive, it says that they're hearing these parables and they're like, he's talking about us. And now they get ticked off, right? And so that basically now they're saying, how can we get a hold of this guy? How can we throw him in jail? How can we beat him up? How can we kill this guy, basically? And then Jesus, he hears this, and then he gives them this parable that we see here. And that, as I said, it's the parable of the wedding feast or the parable of the banquet, um, whatever your translation or your um, heading might say. And just one little note that I do want to make about the Pharisees. I was listening to um, a good study and discussion on them today, is that scribes and Pharisees were not in themselves horrible, bad people. Sometimes we can get caught up with talking about them because there are many bad examples in the New Testament specifically. Um, We sometimes make it synonymous, Pharisees synonymous with hypocrite, right? Which there were many that were hypocrites. There were many that were power hungry, that rejected Christ. But before Jesus had come on the scene, they were actually like the heroes to a lot of the Jewish people. So like if you were a young boy or a young girl, those are the people that you were looking up to. So in today's world, that would be like for the, those in the church, it'd be like the big conservative Bible teachers or pastors or something like that that you would hear or see. So whenever Jesus comes on the scene and he starts calling out certain Pharisees and scribes and these different religious leaders, this is scandalous. You know, this is shocking to them, which I know because we've heard these stories before and we know how this all goes, sometimes it doesn't hit our ears the same way. But whenever they're actually hearing this and they basically are saying, Jesus is calling out like the main people in society right now. And he's saying that these guys aren't doing so hot. So I think that's that's just something to point out of just significance. So anyway, We see this parable now. Jesus is responding to these Pharisees, these scribes, these religious leaders that are so upset with him. He gives this parable of the wedding feast or the banquet. And we see that he mentions this king 
his son, and then there is the wedding feast or the banquet. And as we've seen in many of them, we know that the king primarily usually references God. And then we have God's son, which is Jesus. And then for the wedding feast, this is the This is the messianic feast in which Christ and his bride will have when he returns and he collects us to be with him, and then we are with him forever to celebrate in the feast of the Lamb. So basically what he's telling us then in the story is how there is this king who is inviting a certain group of people, right? He's sending out his servants, and these servants are going out to these invited guests, and then the guests, they come and they give certain excuses or reasons, and they say, you know, I'm going back to my farm, or I'm going back to my job, or I got this going on. And then you have some others that whenever they get these servants who are inviting them to this great wedding feast, that they abuse the servants, and that they actually will kill some of them. And then the king finds out about this. He gets furious. He sends out his armies, and he destroys and kills a lot of those murderers in the city. And then he sends out more servants, right? And these servants go and they, he says, go invite anybody, not just the people that were invited initially, not just the high class citizens. I want you just to go invite anyone you find. I want you to say, come to the banquet, come to the wedding. And then there are lots of guests that fill this banquet hall, right? And it says that there are some bad ones and some good guests, right? And then in this story, we see that the king, you know, as the wedding's probably about to begin or it just happened, the king walks in and he sees there's this guest and he's not wearing the proper wedding garments. And the king, once again, we see him getting furious. And then he asks him, you know, why are you in here without a wedding garment? And then he, it says he's speechless. And then he basically tells his people to bind him hand and foot cast him into outer darkness, and then he uses the same similar language of um, condemnation um, that he uses another with the weeping or the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. And then he does this summary statement, which um, we uh, based our series on in the past, on being chosen, um, for many are called, but few are chosen. So then there's just three big um, points that I want to pull out of the text tonight for us when we hear this story, when we think about it. And the the first one I want to do is this, is that God in this story is showing how he is inviting everyone to come to the banquet. See, in the very beginning, he invites presumably Israel or those who um, had the covenant with him, those who knew him before Christ had come on the scene. He gives this invite to them and he says, hey, this is something to people that were already invited. They already knew this wedding was about to happen. And he comes and says, hey, guys, it's, it's ready. The fatted calf is, you know, killed. We're, we're getting all these festivities. It's ready to go. Come on, let's go. And then they don't come. And as I said, then he goes out and he just starts to extend this invitation out to the world. And I just think that this is important for a couple of reasons. Just one, when we think about an invitation, think about the significance of an invitation, right? If you got an invitation for, to go to Stephen's wedding, or um, there's some invitations to go to like some of the different things that we have going on upcoming. The point of the invitation is it's a clear declaration of me or whoever is offering it is saying, this is something that we are coming to celebrate. This is something that we are going to do to have joy. And I want you to come and be a part of that same joy. Right, And we've seen in these other parables about all this joy and about these celebrations and how there's this invitation to come on in. And that's what is happening here is God is basically saying, I don't care who you are or where you come from. I am giving this invitation. But with an invitation, we always know that there's what on the other side? The receiving of it, right? The choice to choose. Am I going to accept the invitation or reject it. And this then points, I think, to since God is inviting every single person to come to this banquet, it points to God's universal love for the world. 
And we see that in John 3.16, for God so loved the world, the cosmos, right? God loves every single one of us he has created. And then we also know in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that he, um, it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, to the knowledge of the truth. So this invitation is a genuine, authentic offer for each of us. However, the, the next application is this, is though there is this invitation, we know from this parable that some have and will reject God's invitation. And that's what we see here. We see that some, as I said, made some excuses or just, it says that they didn't take it seriously and they were basically apathetic about it. They could care less. Like they weren't like, no, that's a horrible thing. I don't ever want to go there. But they're like, I got some better things to do. And that's how some people are in this world. Some people, when they hear the invitation of the gospel, when they hear about the goodness of God, when they are invited to church, they, they're not necessarily saying that it's a horrible thing. They might even not be against certain aspects of it. But overall, it's just very either way for them. And that's what we see some of these people. But then there's others that kill the servants. And this is a demonstration of clear hatred for the king. And that's clear hatred for God. In which there are people also that aren't as apathetic, but they actually hate who God is, what he stands for. They hate his son. They hate his servants. And then as we see in Israel's past, many of them killed the prophets, right? In Matthew 23, 37, it says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets, right? And then stones the ones that I have sent you. That's what um, he, Jesus says. And then we also know in John 1, 10 to 12, it says that he was not received by his own. So this points to the fact that this son, Jesus Christ, the son of God, this wedding is invited, or they are being invited to his wedding. And those who had the invitations already, they knew it was coming. They hated the king and others. At best, they were apathetic about him. And then, so what we see then is there's this narrow context in which we see what the Pharisees and the scribes, how they were reacting, and Jesus is saying, you're being like those wedding guests, or the invite, invitees who were invited to the wedding but just never come because you, you truly hate God. But then we see that there's this more broad application that says this could be to anyone. Anyone who hates God or is apathetic for God is going to have the same result that we see in this text. And what did the king do? He sent his armies to destroy the murderers and their city. So this is a clear demonstration of God's judgment. So if you are somebody that is apathetic about God, or if you hate God, then you will be judged. And then there's this clear um, foreshadowing, potentially, of AD 70 here, in which Jerusalem and the temple is destroyed not much later, after they did crucify Christ and they rejected him. So we see that God is inviting everyone to come to the banquet. We see some have and will reject God's invitation. But then we see that some have and will accept God's invitation. And that's what we see here. It says that the, the wedding banquet, it is filled with guests. So this thing is full, right? So even though all the people God originally invited, the king originally invited, they didn't show up. But God is still going to get the glory. The king is still going to be honored. That, that banquet hall is still going to be full, is the application there. And the, there are these guests who basically represent us as disciples, who, despite our unworthiness, we get to be a part of the festivities, right? Because we originally, none of us had the invite originally. None of us were the high class, high society. We weren't the just, the rich, right? The spiritually wealthy. We weren't that. But the king graciously still invited us to come. Can you imagine being invited to be like one of the most prestigious events in all of history? It'd be like if you could think of like a king. Oh yeah, there you go. It's Stephen's wedding, the most high esteem wedding, right? Yeah. To be invited to that, right? And to just think about that. And you think, I, you know, I'm not worthy. I didn't earn this, right? But I was still invited. I was thought of. I, I am included in this. But then we see that there are these guests who, though they were unworthy, they came in and they put on the proper wedding attire. But then there is this improperly dressed guest. 
See, you would think that the, the whole parable ends before this, right? You would see that there's the guest that didn't come, they rejected the invitation, then you have the others that they accepted the invitation and they came, and you would think, okay, good, so it's basically accept the invitation, right? And that is a huge part of it. But they, they extend this parable, I think, for a very important reason. And we see then that there's this guest, he's improperly dressed, and I think this represents those who, though they hear the gospel, Though they hear the teachings of the Bible, or though they may be in church or in fellowship with Christians, they are not personally in a loving, salvific relationship with Christ. They are not clothed in Christ, meaning they have not truly placed their faith in Him. They have not truly turned from their sins and said, Lord, I want you to save me. See, it's not something that's works-based. It's simply allowing the garment to come on. It's saying, Lord, I just want you to give me what you offer. But this is the important thing is you can hear the invitation and you can like the benefits of the invitation. But at the end of the day, if you start to try to come to the feast, if you try to come to this banquet, even though you hear the invitation and you like it, if you haven't gotten to that point where you are clothed in Christ and his righteousness, you're going to be like this man here. And it says, what does the man say? It says the man was speechless. And I've heard some non-believers before who have talked about like what they thought they would say if God did exist and if they were in his presence at the end of their lives or something like that and how they said they would try to justify themselves and they would explain, well, I did a lot of this and I'm not as bad as these people. But I think that this man in this parable represents what all people who are not in Christ will really be like when they see God. Yeah, do you have something? Do you have a microphone? Yeah, I think uh, this also could be uh, considered the false religions. Mm -hmm. They're going to the feast. Yep. They think they've got, got it all covered. And and the king walks up and says, you're not covered us by the blood of the lamb. Yeah. You're not covered by Jesus, like you said. So we hear all these false religions, and you, you hear, you say, well, you know, those are good people. Yep, and they, they're going to come to the feast, and they think, but they're going to stand there, and they're going to look there, and they're going to be, you know, uh, undressed. They're not going to have the blood of the Lamb covering them. Uh, so salvation can't be given to them if they haven't accepted. No one comes to the Father except through me, which is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And uh, so I think that also could be false religions. Oh, today. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's anyone who likes anything regarding the kingdom of heaven, eternity, God. Yeah, that's the point is it's not our own works. Whether you're in a, another religion and you're working really hard in that religion, and you think, well, I did all this stuff in this religion. It's not about what you did. It's whether or not are you clothed in Christ. And if you reject the son, if you reject the wedding, if you aren't going to come in, properly dressed it's like could you imagine coming in like i said to a king's royal wedding or the president's royal wedding or something like that and you come in in like you know a tank top flip-flops and some really really short shorts you know what i mean could you imagine how dishonoring that would be that's what it's like when you try to go to the throne of god at the end of our lives or at the last judgment if you go in front of him and you think that this is going to honor or respect him so yeah, there's nothing you can do apart from having Christ and his righteousness, what he did on the cross for us, to be in front of God. And that's why whenever God asks, why do you deserve to be in my kingdom? This person, he's speechless. And the, those who are in Christ, we know that the only thing we can say is this, I don't deserve to be in this kingdom at all, but because of your son, what he did, I now am in him. And that's all a Christian can truly say when it comes to coming to the banquet. I was given the invitation, and I was offered this clothing, and I have just humbly accepted it. That's all I can say. And that's what grace truly is. And then so we see then this man, he is cast now into outer darkness, another description of hell, another description of judgment. And then the point is, once again, you have those who rejected the invitation, who were judged, and then we see those who accepted the invitation but didn't come properly clothed, judged. So the point is, you can't just accept the invitation. You have to accept the invitation and be clothed in Christ. And that's leading then to this summary statement that he says 
in this parable, and he says it in some of his other parables, is the summary statement in verse 14 is, for many are called, but few are chosen. And now if you just um, replace these words uh, from called to invited and from chosen to saved, and it says this, for many are invited, but few are saved. And I think that's how we can learn from this parable is this. God is inviting everyone. But the only way that you are truly saved is if you choose to come, accept that invitation, and then say, Jesus, please forgive me, be my Lord, and be my Savior. So to be chosen, to be saved, you must accept God's invitation and be clothed or to believe in Christ. So are there any um, final thoughts or comments um, before we close? As I said, it'll be a little abbreviated tonight. Any final questions or thoughts? All right, well, once again, that challenge or that encouragement then is this, is accept the invitation if you haven't already. And remember, it's not based on your works or your own merit. It's based on what Christ did for you. And believe in Him, trust in Him, and remember it's all about what He did for you. So this will conclude our time of study.